Thank you for joining us today. In this episode, we'll be getting into dependent claims, what they do, and why we use them. So just a quick note, this episode builds upon my independent claim writing example in a previous episode. So you will get the most out of this episode if you watch that episode first. I put a link to that episode in the description below. So if needed, go watch that episode real quick and then come on back. So now let's get into what dependent claims are and why we use them. Dependent claims are named as such because they depend from an independent claim. They include everything in the independent claim plus more stuff. This can give you a range of coverage from broad to detailed. Dependent claims are used to have explicit coverage for various embodiments of your invention. And the term embodiment basically means a variation. So when you hear the word embodiment or embodiments, that just means ver variation or variations. Some inventors wonder, why do we even need these dependent claims if the independent claim covers everything? Well, here are the main reasons. In patent applications, it can improve your chance of getting a patent to issue, and in an issued patent, it can improve your chance of successful patent enforcement. Now let's see just why that is. On this graph, the more to the right you go, the more broad or general the claims are. And the further to the left we go, the more narrow and specific our claims are. Now, the broader a claim is, the easier it is to invalidate. And for a patent application, this might mean the patent office doing a search and finding some prior art that basically knocks out that independent claim before it ever becomes part of your issued patent. For an issued patent, it could be a competitor that you are trying to sue for infringement, and that competitor may do a similar thing, additional searching in an attempt to invalid invalidate a claim. It is a common strategy in patent litigation. Narrow claims are harder to invalidate with prior art because you have to find something more specific in order to do so. So they usually have a better chance of getting allowed to become part of an issued patent and are also harder to invalidate in this way during patent litigation. So to summarize, independent claims are broader than their dependent claims, and independent claims cover more potential competition, but are easier to invalidate. So with that said, let's get into the specifics of our example. So from the previous episode on independent claim writing, we finished with this example claim. And again, this is an example for teaching purposes. This is not my invention, and these aren't real patent claims. So these claims may not conform to every rule and best practice. Again, we are using this as a teaching tool. So given this independent claim, let's take a look at some possible dependent claims. To make a dependent claim, we are going to write a claim 2 that depends from the claim 1 and includes more stuff. That means claim 2 will include every limitation of claim 1, plus some other things. So here is a second claim that adds more detail about the angle we mentioned in claim 1. We can have a claim to a number of spokes, and a claim to what material the wheel is made out of. Okay, so here's a thinking exercise for you. Take a look at claim 1, and now, which one of these dependent claims that you see here is most relevant to our invention? Pause the video for about 20 or 30 seconds or so and take a guess. Okay, what did you pick? Claim 2 is a further limitation of the angle of the flange. And recall, that was the main point of this invention, the flange to direct air to the brake rotors to help keep them cool. Claim 2 is directly related to our invention, whereas claims 3 and 4, while they may be valid, are ancillary. They are not necessarily bad or wrong, but they are less likely to be helpful than Claim 2. So this is an important factor in deciding what should be included in our independent claims. In the United States, the basic application fee entitles you to three independent claims and a total of 20 claims altogether. While more claims can be added for an additional fee, the majority of the time, people stick to the 320 policy described in the first line. That said, we want to prioritize dependent claims that cover inventive elements before adding any ancillary claim elements. If all the inventive elements have been covered and there are still less than 20 claims in the patent application, then it may make sense to add some ancillary dependent claims to get the count to 20. 
After all, you paid for 20, so it usually makes sense to have 20, though sometimes applications are filed with less than 20. So to revisit my invention, the flange serves to direct air towards the interior of the rim to cool the brake rotor. But I also have another embodiment with a curved flange. So since I have this other embodiment, I probably want to consider removing the ancillary dependent claims for the moment and add a dependent claim for my curved flange. And maybe another dependent claim to cover details of the curve. How curved is it, etc. Note that claim 4 depends from claim 3, which depends from claim 1. So claim 4 includes everything from claim 1, plus everything from claim 3, plus anything recited in claim 4 itself. So now the dependent claims shown here are all related to my inventive concept, which was the slot and the flange. Recall, the invention had nothing to do with really how many spokes or what materials were used to make the rim. So only after I have covered everything about the inventive part, if there are still less than 20 claims, then perhaps I may add some dependent claims to cover ancillary features. But only after I have covered all things that are directly related to my improvement. So just to recap, the rules we covered are Dependent claims should cover the inventive elements before including claims to ancillary elements. The U.S. filing fee includes three independent claims and 20 total, although that number can be exceeded for an additional fee. And as we saw, we use dependent claims for a range of claim coverage. So hopefully that helps shed some light on what the dependent claims are used for. Thanks again for watching this episode of Inventor's Quick Tips, and we'll see you again soon.